Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Discovery Services, Libraries and Beyond, A Glimpse into a Possible Future, which is sponsored by Ex Libris, a ProQuest company. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you will see a Q&A panel and a chat panel. Please feel free to use the Q&A panel to submit questions to our panelists. At the end of the presentation, we'll take a few minutes to answer your questions, so please submit them throughout. You can use the chat panel to alert the host, who is me, to any technical issues you may be experiencing, and I will troubleshoot those issues with you privately. Please also note that today's program is being recorded and all reg registrants will receive follow-up instructions on how to access uh, the archived version. And now I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers today, Peter McCracken, Jesse Kennecke, and Eddie Neuwirth. Peter, is a or Peter was a reference librarian at East Carolina State University and then the University of Washington before starting Serial Solutions with three others in 2000. He was responsible for development and maintenance of the Serial Solutions knowledge base through 2007. In 2009, he left to found shipindex.org, an e-resources site that helps people do research on ships. This past June, he joined Cornell University as Electronic Resources Librarian. Jesse Kennecke is the Director of Acquisitions and e-resource licensing services at Cornell University Library. He is responsible for acquisition of content in all formats, print and electronic, serial and monograph. During his 16 years as a librarian at Cornell, Jesse has also been closely involved with many initiatives for improving the user experience with discovery to delivery of library and information resources. And Eddie Neuwirth is the Director of Product Management, Discovery Services for Ex Libris, a ProQuest company, where he has taken a lead team member, where he has been a lead team member in developing the groundbreaking summon service and is responsible for the next generation 360 link, link resolver. He has over 12 years of experience in delivering innovative discovery products for libraries and in his current role works closely with clients to optimize the academic research experience and to understand the impacts of new technologies on discovery. At this point, we are ready to get started, so I will turn the floor over to you, Peter. I care a lot about. Um, thanks, it's good to be here. I'm glad to be talking with you about a subject that, a subject that matters a lot to me. I uh, have been uh, working with the knowledge bases for a long time, and um, what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about it, provide an overview of the knowledge bases, those that uh, manage linking and those that manage the discovery layer, and then look at some opportunities for growth as we move forward. Uh, so I'm looking at the back end, and then uh, Jesse, I believe, will be talking a bit more about the public side of the um, uh, discovery process here at, at Cornell. To start, uh, well, let's see. To start, I think it's really important to know how uh, critical the knowledge base is for uh, everything that uh, one does. Um, the, uh, it's, it is what generates, uh, runs a whole lot of the services that we use for tracking and identifying electronic resources from the link resolver uh, to A to Z lists, mark records. All of these come from the knowledge base that runs the uh, link resolver, and I've always felt that a failure to link means a failure to locate. So this is something that uh, is really uh, quite important to me. I'd like to provide a quick overview of what the knowledge, this part of the knowledge base looks like, uh, and I'd like to emphasize that right now what I'm talking about is 
the knowledge base that looks at uh, linking to uh, electronic resources. I'll be comparing and contrasting that with the discovery index for uh, the discovery layer, which is a little bit different. First, we have, of course, the uh, title lists. They're coming from many different uh, content providers. Um, we use the KBART. We uh, companies use the KBART structure to pass that information into the central knowledge base. So it's that knowledge base that has the information that makes all of the other things work. When you have a citation that's being sent with a an open URL to that knowledge base, it has to check that knowledge base to figure out if it can find a uh, resource or not. And one thing that's important to know about the knowledge base is, is how it's structured in the sense that it doesn't know the articles that are in a particular journal. It just knows that a full journal uh, is available in a resource from you know, this date here to another date in the future. It does not have information about the articles that are in there, and that will be important, I think, as we go forward a little bit uh, in what I uh, want to share today. So if this central knowledge base has information to indicate that a full text article is available, then the system will use an open, the you open URL standard to create a link to take you to there. Uh, also, we use, um, companies can use the hosted HTML. Um, again, they're using that same knowledge base to create the A to Z lists and then other tools to create MARC records and other uh, resources that provide linking. So there's a whole lot of places that data can go wrong, lots of opportunities for, for errors. And it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, uh, total accuracy is certainly um, a goal, though um, it, it, total accuracy is, is impractical. Uh, there are a lot of different errors that can occur, and it's important to keep those in mind when we're looking at uh, this linking question. First, um, false positives. Those are pretty easy to identify. You say, I'm looking for, from an an abstract and indexing database, you see, I'm looking for this article, and the, the, the link resolver knowledge base says, oh, it's over here, it takes you there, but it's not actually there. Those are pretty easy to spot, to identify, and then say, hey, what's the problem? Why did this fail? False negatives, though, are a whole lot trickier, where you ask the knowledge base to, to give you a link to an, from an, uh, an article, uh, from a citation, and it says, oh, I'm sorry, it's not available when in fact, in fact it actually is. Obviously, it's much more difficult because all of your resources are all coming from that one knowledge base. So it's critical that that knowledge base be accurate. And um, therefore, when you're looking at that knowledge base, you, one should think that you know, about every full text resource that has zero titles in it is a potential problem because it would appear that there's no metadata about the content in that particular resource. I want to be clear, however, here that I'm talking about um, the full text resources and I'm talking about the knowledge, the link resolver knowledge base. An, art, an abstracting and indexing database with zero titles is okay because they're there for the discovery layer, not for the link resolver. And how these two databases, these two knowledge bases are built can vary from um, provider to provider. Maybe they're all one knowledge base, one great big huge database that's divided into parts. Maybe they're two separate ones. It doesn't really matter how, how they're built. Uh, you know, in the, on the, the back end, what matters is how it appears for librarians and for patrons. So the discovery layer uh, container is, is, is similar but different. It's an index rather than a knowledge base. It, it doesn't actually have that bibliographic data. It has any kind of searchable data. And right now we're talking about textual data, uh, which is a, um, in some ways a, a challenge. There are lots of resources that we need to figure out how to uncover and how to make visible uh, that are non-textual. Uh, and the difference here from the uh, no, discovery, the knowledge base for link resolving is that you have all of these index files with these text files that are sent to the index. Text search will go into the index and it may actually use the open URL to find the full text of the article in one resource or perhaps use relevance ranking to find it through other resources. So it's very much similar but different. But most importantly, we want to go beyond text. We want to find other ways to search uh, non-textual content. Here are a couple of examples, and I want to investigate a few of these, but don't have time to go into all of them. But by looking at a few of them, perhaps we can um, make clear what, what we would like to see in the future in discovery layers and the knowledge bases that manage them. 
uh, I have a great interest in maritime history, so of course when I did some searching, I was looking at at, at ships, at maritime things. Uh, this is an example of metadata that is in the discovery layer. Uh, in this case, excuse me. Um, in this case, the information comes from Art Store, and it says uh, a schooner in a harbor by Hawksworth. Now, if you know a bit about uh, vessels, you might say, hey, that's actually not a schooner because it's got, got square sails hanging from yards, so it's a square rig ship, not a schooner. Um, it does have a fore and aft sail back here, but just one, so that makes it a bark or a, a, a bark. But, and also, I note that we only have about five or six words here. So if I remember my idioms correctly, we're missing about 995 words here. Maybe some of those would better describe uh, that it's actually a bark in a harbor rather than a schooner in a harbor. But that's the information that Art Store provided and put into the, in this sense, in this case, the summon discovery layer. Here's some metadata that is uh, not in the discovery layer, and that's because it in not in Summon, and that's because it's local. This is from a collection uh, at the Johnson Museum of Art here at Cornell. This is uh, the um, blue nose here. If you've got a Canadian dime in your pocket uh, right now, then that's the vessel that's on that dime there. Um, and here's some information, the um, information that the uh, Johnson Museum has put together about it. And if I search someone for it, I'd search Barrett, Gallagher, Schooner, Blue Nose. I'm not going to find it there because that information isn't in there yet. So that's something that uh, hopefully in the future we'll find ways of getting this information into that uh, discovery layer. Another, um, and, and so these are a couple of the different things. So some content is present, some is not. But in all cases here, we're doing textual search. Uh, so perhaps sometime in the future we'll find discovery layers that do image searching uh, as um, as Google Images does. Uh, so that would be that would be a real uh, interesting development in in discovery layers. Here's something I'd like to point out. This is a neat database. It's called uh, the History Makers, which has uh, recorded oral histories of uh, prominent African Americans. And I did a search for. Uh, Medgar Evers and found this resource. And what I'd like to point out is uh, this resource, this interview with Mildred von Roxborough, who described her travels uh, through Mississippi with Medgar Evers. And one of the interesting things here is that, you know, you can't really put images into a discovery layer, but you can put text into a discovery layer. And the folks at the History Makers have done something um, uh, pretty neat here. They've, they've not only transcribed what she said, but they've expanded it in a useful way. So she says, uh, you know, in the transcription of her oral history, she says, let's see, if he graduated from high school in 47, it would probably be about 1951. And the folks at the History Makers have added 1947 in brackets there so that you can search that if you're searching the transcript. Um, <clears throat> And uh, another thing that they've done is they've, she, she mentions her mother and they've put, um, they've put her mother's name uh, in here so that it's findable. So that's the sort of stuff that would be great to see eventually getting into the uh, discovery index and then be able to link out directly to that resource. If you're writing a paper about Medgar Evers, uh, this would be, this is pretty interesting stuff. She's got some very interesting uh, stories to share and it's a great uh, resource if it's findable. Here's another video with, uh, this one actually does have a lot of metadata. It's the Shackles of Tradition by Franz Boas, and if we uh, go forward and search and summon, we do find it as the second link with the streaming video uh, available there. But what's not available in here is that the, um, the, there is clearly a transcript, and that is not in the database. Uh, the, it's a little bit different from that uh, history makers because it's simply a transcription of the uh, of the text that was said. They didn't haven't expanded it like the folks at history makers had. But if you take that and search it in uh, Summon, even though we know that the link is that there's some metadata in there, we can see that the closed captioning in uh, text is not in there. So that's another thing that would be neat to see uh, in the future. Uh, there are other things that can be difficult to find, and this is a, a, a challenge not from the point of view of the discovery layer, but the uh, point of view of the vendor who is providing 
uh, information. So if I go into uh, uh, Swank, which we have uh, a subscription to here at Cornell, and I feel like I want to find a nice, uh, a nice light maritime movie to watch uh, one Friday night, and I search for the bounty uh, with Mel Gibson, I um, say, oh, okay. So I see that I can find it by typing just uh, bounty. But if I type bounty and Mel Gibson, nothing is found. If I type only Mel Gibson, nothing is found. So this is information, if this is the searchable metadata that Swank has that they would then share with the discovery layer, and we're not going to be able to find that in those discovery layers. If I do a search for Bounty and Mel Gibson in uh, someone, I find over 20,000 results and only the first 200 are going to come back, so I'm not going to be able to find a link to it. And I mean, Mel Gibson doesn't actually matter since Swank didn't provide that information. So if I can only search for, with, for the word bounty, um, and I'm, I end up with 1.1 million citations, you know, they're not going to come back. Now, there are ways to narrow it down, of course, by, um, by the resource type, but still, it uh, adds quite a, a bit of a challenge. And, and uh, perhaps a problem in the other direction is uh, data sets. If all of the data went into uh, the index in the discovery layer, it could be there would be overwhelming and it would be very difficult to find all of that information. But uh, what is neat to find is that there are some sets with excellent metadata that can be easily discovered in uh, some. And this is an example, of course, I was searching for vessels here, and I found this uh, great collection of Dutch um, ships and sailors. Um, it's a, it's a data set that uh, some folks in the Netherlands did looking at the uh, VOC, the Dutch East India Company, and there's a whole lot of useful terms that are in this uh, abstract here that make it findable. So that's a neat uh, thing to see. There could be instances where we do want to have the entire uh, content of the data set in there, but that would be pretty overwhelming. So I think there's an area in relevance where we can do a lot more work to improve uh, the searching in the uh, discovery layer. So those are a couple of examples. I also uh, highlight some the music and performances, and there are uh, archived websites as a potential item that one might want to be uh, findable through a discovery layer, websites that are relevant to the institution. But I think the important points uh, that I would like to highlight, the points I'd most like to highlight is that for getting from a citation to the full text, the accurate knowledge base is absolutely critical. For discovering content, a complete discovery index is critical, and to get from a citation in the index to the full text elsewhere, both are really critical. So among these and with other things, I think there's a lot of opportunities for a significant growth and enhancement in discovery layers going to the future. So those are a few points that I think are important to look at when we're thinking about where we'll go uh, from here. Thanks very much for your time. Uh, and now I believe I'll turn it over to uh, Jesse, who's across the table from me. Well, hi, everybody. Um, hopefully the slides are now moved to di assembling the discovery puzzle. Um, this is my opportunity to share with you some of the work Cornell University has done around discovery over the past uh, few years and um, how that's really a puzzle that we're trying to put together. There are a lot of different pieces of that puzzle. Um, discovery services being a, a key one of the key part of that, um, but some other work we've done to try to bring all that together. So um, let me just figure out technology here. Okay, so there's my puzzle. but. Um, uh, when I think about discovery and, and kind of the ways we've improved or tried to improve the user experience uh, here at Cornell, I find it comes down to search boxes and silos often. Uh, that could be a new role-playing game, I suppose, as well. And uh, so what I mean by that is uh, when we look a little bit at the history of Cornell's discovery, back in 2007, we had... Um, this was sort of the top bit of our website. Um, and below this, uh, there were, from this site, you could probably find four or five, maybe more search boxes. Some of them right on this front page and others a click or so away to search various things, not to mention all the search boxes you could get to if you went into subscribed databases or various other places. 
Um, at the time, we had uh, web feet, federated search as our sort of article discovery equivalent, as well as trying to manage a database, uh, the ability to get into individual databases. And um, so we had many search boxes. Not all of them were easy to find. It didn't necessarily make sense uh, to go to one over another. And each of those was limited in scope to the one, one service it provided, uh, whether that was for articles, uh, databases, library catalog content, um, e-journals or images, and so they were limited in scope that way. And uh, by silos, I'm referring to the different uh, content areas you might go to, like those articles and databases and things. And the user had to pick one of those before they could really start. So they either, they picked that by going to whatever search box they found and typing in terms, or they um, or some of them knew which ones they were going to. They wanted to find a particular database, so they would search for that and get to that database and use it. Um, but it was clear looking at search logs at the time that people were typing just about anything into just about any search box they could find. And um, the, uh, but so each of those silos was customized to serve a certain purpose. So whatever search the user did to get into that silo would be more or less useful depending on um, what the end result was. And um, so by 2012, um, we made an overhaul to our site, um, trying to think about those search boxes and silos in different ways. We had replaced web feet with the summon discovery service by that point, um, and that's powering our articles and ebook search. Um, but we still had these different silos here. There, we had what looked like a single search box right here, but really it was uh, five or six search boxes laid on top of each other, depending on which of these silos you picked. And the user had to pick one of these to start their search. Um, so the default was the catalog limited to our fairly extensive uh, seven million bibliographic record catalog, but, uh, but still limited to just that. Um, and with no ability to search articles. And if they could search articles, that would eliminate uh, the books and other things that were in our print collections. So um, so we had still many search boxes, but integrated into one, trying to provide a little guidance for users on what that meant. Um, the search boxes were still limited to the scope of what was at the other end of that search box, what, uh, what silo was at the other end. Um, and uh, we believe our silos were easier to find, but still um, it wasn't apparent to a user coming to this site which one would be the most useful to serve their purpose. So um, we come to today. This is the site we've had in place for, um, I guess, going on two years now. Um, uh, this was part of a major overhaul in how we um, how we do our development here, as well as how we work with our users to uh, to build our our discovery, to to do our discovery work. Um, so, over the last maybe five or six years, we've developed an extensive usability, uh, a systematic usability testing um, group around here, where. Um, Librarians and developers and other staff take part on these teams, and will uh, will do true usability testing uh, with undergraduates, with uh, graduates, with faculty, whatever group they need to test the particular thing. And they're really testing a small set of questions each time they do that. But that feeds um, a user representative group um, who pours through sort of the results of those usability tests as well as other feedback they've gotten to uh, come up with changes, recommended changes to the site, which goes through a project manager who then translates that into um, development goals for the developers. Um, the developers work on that and then that cycle repeats usability testing on the changes <clears throat> to inform the user representative group again. Um, and so we've so we've adopted uh, this cycle, which is um, in IT terms, it's an agile development cycle. Um, things like Summon and other discovery services are developed on this kind of cycle as well, where it's more continuous updates but smaller things than 
the traditional waiting five years for the next big update to happen. So using this process, we now have this new site that gets continually updated. And when we look at our silos <clears throat> and search boxes, we now do have a, a one search box or as close to that as we can get um, that's front and center. If a user types uh, words into that and hits search, it's going to do, um, uh, we'll see a, a result screen that I'll show you shortly. Um, but this box covers several silos at once. Um, but because we also know there are users that do know some of these different tools that are available to them, down here they could select the individual silo that they they do want to use. If they know what they want is something from our library catalog, um, if they want a general article in full-text search, for example, or they're looking for a database, we provide the means to get to that, that discovery tool right off. <clears throat> Um, but so there's still many silos, and in fact, the way I see it is we have more silos than in previous iterations, but we're presenting them at the point of need um, and customized to serve uh, individual purposes. Um, and uh, then we test to see if that works. So this is what happens with a general search um, without picking any of the silos up front. We have a uh, what we, what's called a bento box search result screen. So um, typical uh, uh, facets over to one side, um, but then individual boxes of results um, off to the right-hand side that show um, different types of content. Um, and to the, for the most part, these, are, these different uh, boxes are from different discovery sources. Um, with the format, uh, the formats here on the side um, being merged uh, facets from several different uh, resources. So for example, books and theses in this particular example are two separate sets of results coming out of our library catalog. Um, we now use uh, the Blacklight open source uh, search and display uh, software to power our catalog. Um, though staff day-to-day -day are managing all of our records in the Voyager uh, library management system, those records get fed into this blacklight layer and then distributed or are, are searchable through this tool. So uh, we divide out books and theses on this particular interface here um, from that. We have some websites also coming from that catalog, and these are um, web resources that we've cataloged mostly on purpose, uh, things having to do with Cornell University or things uh, important to our area. Uh, but then over here, journal articles, uh, this is results coming from Summit, uh, what we are, we've dubbed our article and full text uh, tool. And so the facets to the side here, journal articles and newspaper articles are specifically coming from that. Each of these boxes provides a link at the bottom if, if this sampling of results looks like, well, first of all, if exactly what the person wants is here, they can click on that and get through to uh, hopefully the full text or information about where the book's shelved or whatever it might be. Um, but if they instead find that one of these boxes is the kind of stuff they're looking for, then they can click in the, the button at the bottom and they'll get taken off to sort of their full search in that particular tool. Um, and so we also dish out a, a, uh, a bento box section for library websites. Um, this is uh, anything in the library.cornell.edu domain as well as a few other domains using the Google search application. Um, this was sort of a weird... Uh, side piece of all this, we always had a little search box in the upper corner of our website saying search this website. Users would sometimes put book titles in that, would do, um, would put a database title in there, something like that, and usually would not get the result they're looking for because those weren't necessarily referred to on a library website. Um, we did find enough searching for things that might be on a library website. And um, though, so we felt this was an important uh, box to include in the bento results. Um, but uh, um, so on this page, 
Um, there, oh, so one other service. So there are a lot of discovery services out there. The, so Blacklight is a discovery service we maintain here at Cornell using our catalog records. Um, Summon is one we license that we will drive users off to that are served well by that journal article search. Um, but we also have another here, uh, WorldCat Local uh, at Cornell, which is the WorldCat.org site, but uh, skinned and, and uh, built to serve the Cornell population a little better. And that actually gets users to books that maybe Cornell doesn't have or aren't available here. So um, on this uh, this search here, if you can see in the looking for more spot I just blew up here, um, there's uh, somebody did a search. Um, maybe they know they're looking for a book. Uh, one of the options here is to request from libraries worldwide. Clicking that. Um, takes the user directly to WorldCat Local, where they might be served by, say, our BorrowDirect consortial borrowing service or interlibrary loan, um, or they may come across some other, other results. So this is yet another piece to that puzzle that um, we're trying to bring in. Um, and, we've, uh, so we've, and then when I talked about more silos, so we've got books and theses that I showed you on that front page. Um, but sometimes users might be presented with a videos or musical recordings, uh, bento box on that home page. And we present these different boxes based on the, uh, the relevance within the results set. So if the results are video heavy or there are some videos towards the top of the blacklight search, uh, they'll typically be presented with a video uh, bento box as well. Um, so we're, again, trying to – we've added – silos to some extent, but we're trying to guide the user as quickly as possible to the silo that best serves their needs. Um, and uh, we can customize each of these uh, to some extent. So the journal article uh, bento result um, can take a user straight out to summon, where we use as much as possible the out-of-the-box summon service, um, customizing it to make sure it's going to show Cornell uh, items available to users at Cornell right off. Um, and uh, you can see similar actual design decisions here even on Summon with things like the, um, the this result from Wikipedia here being uh, to help the user figure out if they're searching for the right thing. Um, the same kind of facet decisions over here. Um, and within Summon results, you can also get uh, database recommendations. So again, if the user maybe went off to summon and still turned out not to be the right thing, there's some recourse for them possibly to, to get at the right kind of content. So these are all pieces of the overall puzzle um, that we've been trying to fit together as well as we can here at Cornell. And um, in some cases, we've got data that can help one of these services do a better job uh, living in another one or living somewhere else. Um, so the last thing I want to try to cover is uh, looking at um, where we're cross-linking some data to try to make sure we can get um, we can bring data from one service into another. So this is a mark record uh, for um, for an e-book, I believe, um, and in it, uh, in this section that I highlighted here, is. Um, some code, the 899 field there has uh, what looks like gibberish, um, and it's repeats of some data that's in the 856 uh, subfield I there. These are actually the codes from our uh, Intota system uh, that represent the provider of this resource, um, the database that it's from, as well as a title ID in the 856 field. We use these because, uh, so we have data in our MARC record in our Voyager catalog, um, and then we have other data sitting in our, um, in Intota, uh, such as license terms that we may want to dish out on our public display. So this is from our Blacklight uh, catalog search results uh, for an ebook, um, and down at the bottom here you can see a terms of use link. Most users aren't going to care what these are. Uh, but we have signed agreements indicating we will inform our users of the terms of use. 
Um, we also do have some terms of use that we do urge people to look at, uh, particularly with ebooks, maybe the simultaneous use of those books before they put it on a, on a course website or something like that. So we provide these terms of use links, and um, those link to uh, the license terms that we've chosen to display here from our Intota system. So um, authorized users, number of users for it. Um, for certain library staff that aren't using Intota itself, things like interlibrary loan terms, course reserve terms, things like that. Some of the ones that might be the most useful for people outside of our licensing staff. So um, that was an attempt to bring uh, some of these puzzle pieces together that are interrelated. And in the end, we want to have a whole puzzle that fits together as well as possible. And uh, now I'm going to pass it on to Eddie to talk about uh, his plans. Great. Thank you, Jesse. And uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, I am uh, Eddie Neuwirth. Uh, as, as Mark mentioned, I'm the Discovery Product Manager for Ex Libris. Uh, that means I share responsibilities, uh, product management responsibilities across both the Primo, Discovery Service, and Summon. Uh, so I'll be talking about both of those today. Um, I wanted to pick up from uh, where Jesse and, and Peter left off and sort of continue to look uh, at sort of what, where do we go from here in terms of what, where do we see the, our sort of strategy around discovery um, and, and where can we see you know, future improvement? Um, before I get there, it probably makes sense to take a step back and kind of uh, look at how, how we got to this point, uh, where we are today. Um, many of you might remember the, the 2009 uh, Ithaca, Ithaca faculty survey. Um, at that time, there was sort of some, some uh, so, you know, in a way, a, a dire look at the state of, of libraries and, and sort of this notion that there was a perceived um, diminishing of the role of the library in terms of uh, that gateway for seeking information. Uh, and, and this sort of faculty service sort of warned that the library was increasingly being disintermediated uh, from the actual research process. Uh, we'll fast forward to 2015. The, the Ithaca faculty survey uh, was a bit more optimistic uh, and, and sort of had certainly more, more bright notes, I think. Um, in particular, this sort of notion that there was an increase in the perceived importance of the role of the library, uh, in, particularly, in particular in sort of uh, having a role around uh, learning outcomes uh, for students and student success, uh, and certainly the, uh, an, in an improvement in information literacy skills. So that was sort of a, a bright spot. Um, what happened in between there, uh, between sort of 2009 and 2015, if you will, uh, was that libraries and, and providers um, really responded to this notion that uh, libraries were being disintermediated from that research process. And so we saw the, the advent and uh, proliferation, I guess, of, of what you know, was at the time called web, web scale discovery. It was sort of a, a, a move past what Jesse mentioned, which was kind of federated search and different uh, reliance on the catalog um, into sort of a better discovery layer that was pretty rapidly adopted uh, by, by many libraries. And so it, it worked in the sense that we provided this kind of single search box uh, that you could put on your library uh, homepage or, or wherever you wanted to put that. Um, and in a way, it sort of helped with that, that kind of fear and loathing of using the library. It sort of made it easier for users to, to understand, uh, you know, what to do when they got to that library homepage. Um, it's, as we all know, it certainly sort of hasn't solved all the challenges. Uh, that we have around discovery, and there's there's a lot of room to grow and, and continue to evolve. And we see library discovery services, uh, you know, evolving and, and continuing to evolve. Um, one thing to, you know, when any presentation about discovery and sort of the future of discovery, you know, I, I can't get get away from from mentioning Google, of course. You know, maybe in 2009, um, when we rolled out web scale discovery services, we sort of had this notion that. It, you know, that, that would help uh, the library, in a sense, compete with Google. I think now we're, we're much wiser here seven years later and, and, and understand that Google is often the, the go-to place um, and first, first gateway for most of our users, um, but they do find their way to the library. And so it is important to have a, a rich discovery experience for the library, and the challenge is really to, to present users with something once they get to the library uh, that, that really is better and shows the value of what the library can provide. 
Um, even Google, though, as we look at it, is, you know, knows that sort of that single search box is not enough. Um, and what I mean by that is Google, you know, it does, it's not just a search box. You type in words and, you know, luckily, you know, uh, you know they have the get lucky but, uh, button, but you do, you know, don't just magically get these relevant results. Google knows a lot about you uh, as a user. Um, they, and, and they built their search engine and continue to evolve their features to provide what I call sort of contextual recommendations and contextual guidance based on, you know, what they know about you, what they know about queries, what they know about other, other uh, what their users are searching, et cetera. And they use this sort of data-driven approach uh, to provide uh, relevant results, uh, if you will, or sponsored results, however, however you want to look at that. Uh, but they're using a lot of these sort of tools that, that um, we feel do have a place as well within uh, library discovery, and it's really using the context of, of data and what users are searching and what we might know about users uh, to provide the best results um, for, for that researcher. Uh, as Peter mentioned, you know, the, there's been more pressure, I guess, not only from the Google challenge in terms of, of that shaping users' experience and users' expectations for what discovery should be, uh, but just from uh, the sheer amount of data sources that, that we now expect to be part of a discovery service. Uh, when we first sort of rolled out uh, these, these discovery layers, it, it was more about, you know, how do we maybe combine the catalog records with, you know, all the online databases you subscribe to and, and provide a better search experience for that. Uh, but as these discovery services have evolved and libraries continue to, to grow um, their, their content and collections, um, we're seeing sort of the pressure of, you know, the expectation that all these other data sources should also be discoverable at, as part of the discovery service. So, you know, things like digital repositories and, as Jesse pointed out, uh, his library wants to search websites, or maybe it's libguides or course reserves, and then uh, also, you know, things like data sets and outputs that are actually being generated by the university. Uh, and maybe even you want to search your researchers or who are the experts on campus. Um, all of these things are starting, those, the expectations for these things to be discoverable are starting to be put onto uh, that discovery layer. So it, it's a challenge, but it's, a, it's also sort of an opportunity for if the discovery layer can get it right to really provide that sort of differentiation from something like Google, um, which may not be all encompassing or as focused on your particular institution as you might like it to be. And so that brings us to really the key sort of uh, place where I think libraries can, sh can show their most value. And, and we see libraries today being, you know, increasingly pressured um, whether it's from a budget standpoint, whether it's just from a perception standpoint, to really demonstrate the value uh, of what they provide. And um, yet most campuses don't look like this little graphic here where everything's nice, neat, and interconnected. We often see, you know, most, uh, you know, certainly academic institutions finding a real gap between sort of their instructors and faculty uh, in the library, as well as a gap between sort of their students and their perceptions and the library. Uh, and really the, the place for, uh, you know, any library sort of discovery strategy moving forward, uh, we feel is really about sort of maximizing that library contr contribution to sort of the, the greater research and teaching and learning mission that, that might be happening on campus. Uh, and making sure that that gap is really bridged. And that's where that discovery layer our discovery service can really fill a need. As uh, you saw from the sponsorship of this webinar, uh, Ex Libris is now a ProQuest company. Um, it, it feels like longer, but it's been just uh, a little less than a year here since ProQuest and Ex Libris joined forces. Um, it's been a, a sort of marriage of two sort of market-leading, uh, you know, forward-thinking and, and innovative companies. Uh, and the real benefit here is, is in the context of discovery is really sort of accelerating the pace of innovation. Um, there's a lot of great things. Uh, some of them you saw from, from Jesse, you know, with the Summon Discovery Service, a lot of great things and sort of directional uh, enhancements and features around Primo and really the idea of sort of bringing those together uh, in combination with uh, our combined sort of company's extensive experience with academic libraries and uh, extensive experience uh, and expertise around knowledge bases as well as sort of a like-minded kind of openness around collaboration and 
um, and partnerships has really uh, put us in a good spot. I think we're sort of uniquely positioned um, to, uh, to sort of advance discovery here. Um, and one, way, one of the ways we're doing that is by sort of, you know, leveraging kind of the best of both products across Summit and Primo, um, you know, making sure that any sort of uh, good features from either are sort of cross-pollinating uh, both discovery services, so that's, you know, leveraging our expertise around content and metadata, uh, as well as technology um, to make sure that uh, we're bringing the best to both of these services. But really, we're, we're at this point, uh, you know, our strength and our sort of power comes from our customer community. Um, we now have over, you know, 3,000 plus uh, combined libraries using Primo and Summit. Uh, most of those are academic libraries, some uh, of all different sizes, you know, some small libraries as well as uh, a majority of some of the largest and most, you know, prestigious research institutions uh, in the world. And it's really that customer base. Um, that is sort of fueling uh, where we go with the product and what that, wh where we need to go and what that innovation is. Um, there's a very active uh, community network. Uh, we have active user groups as well as a developer's network. Um, and, and it really is a collaboration at this point um, with that customer community. Along with having sort of a very large customer base and a, and a, and a very um, sort of uh, you know, academic heavy customer base, if you will, is that we do have a tremendous amount of usage across our discovery products. And uh, that provides a lot of data for us. And so we're becoming more and more of a sort of uh, big data, data-driven uh, company. Uh, we're able to take um, all of this usage data across now both Summon and Primo and look at things like uh, you know, how are users using the discovery service? What are, the, what are they doing once they reach our discovery interfaces? What are they clicking on? What are their user behaviors? Uh, what types of searches are they doing? Um, how, many query, how many, you know, keywords do they use per query? And sort of take all of that data and feed it back into uh, optimizing our, our discovery solutions and also look for sort of gaps, it's sort of where do we maybe need to, to improve or what sort of things do we need to do to help users, and it, it becomes, uh, you know, very data-focused as well as, you know, customer-driven innovation. So that's what forms the basis of really our discovery strategy. It sort of rests on these these four pillars, the sort of broad and rich content and that, that sort of content expertise, some of what Peter talked about, user experience is a little bit about what uh, Jesse talked about. Uh, and then there's the sort of uh, second half, the right right side of the screen here, um, which is the stuff that I think is exciting and where we can go uh, in terms of sort of improvement. We're sort of scratching the surface. I'm going to run you through some features in a few minutes of some of the things we're doing in these areas. Uh, Jesse pointed out a couple of them on, on their interface. Uh, but these are some of the areas where we, we see sort of, um, you know, libraries having the, the biggest impact and sort of being able to sort of, again, differentiate themselves from other discovery services and really prove their value. Um, some of that is around, um, you know, if we get it right, it really provides that opportunity for, you know, expanding the library's role or, or really um, providing the library a, a more clear role in that sort of research and teaching and, and sort of learning domain. It does all start with our sort of shared content model and the sort of, you know, rich, high-quality index. Um, I think everything that Peter mentioned, you know, points out uh, some of the, the positives around discovery indexes as well as some of the challenges and, and places that, that need improvement. Uh, some of that is, you know, requires cooperation both from uh, content vendors as well as the discovery service. Uh, and, and there's this expectation, again, that, that we're going to be able to discover everything and how do we provide the best opportunity to do that. Uh, it definitely starts with data, high quality data. Um, we have teams of metadata librarians, et cetera, that are working on on this every day. Um, we add enrichment sources like Ulrichs and controlled vocabularies and, and really try to make the richest possible content uh, available. Uh, we also are steadfastly committed to content neutrality. Um, there's a guide we have on the Ex Libris website on uh, a guide to evaluating content neutrality. I welcome people to go look at that. Um, the point there is that you really want to make sure that your discovery service uh, is not biased toward one content type or one content vendor over another. 
Um, and that's critical to, again, the library being able to sort of maximize the value of that discovery service. Um, that notion of having sort of the content neutral discovery service also um, is a factor in providing a superior sort of user interface. Um, it's key to sort of move past uh, your discovery service as being just simply an extension of a database platform. Um, we know that users are looking for something more uh, to meet their expectations. And you also need that kind of rich user experience to be able to deliver some of the sort of features and functionality uh, that, that I'll be talking about here in, in a minute, and sort of being able to expand beyond just that, that simple search and, and can it return, you know, thousands of results? Well, any discovery service can do that, but can, can that discovery service really provide uh, a sort of contextual, um, meaningful experience for your users, and, and that does feed off of that user experience. Um, where we see kind of the most innovation coming uh, is around the, this area of uh, things like personalization and, and being able to provide your users with ways to kind of explore uh, more content than maybe they thought they knew they were looking for, um, and being able to sort of feed off of that idea, um, very similar to sort of the notion that Google knows something about your users. If you think about it, um, particularly in academic libraries, you do know a lot about your users. Um, maybe not individually, uh, but collectively, you know what courses are being taken, you know what courses are being given on campus, you know what some of the research, you know, um, you know the areas of specialty and, and more popular areas of research are on campus. Um, you have uh, tremendous assets to sort of provide contextual guidance to your users um, and sort of anticipate what they might be searching. Um, so within the discovery service, what we want to see is a movement toward, you know, not only providing uh, recommendations and things that, that allow users to kind of help themselves, um, sort of that simple, okay, here's a search box, you can search across the library, uh, but really also provide opportunities for librarians to sort of be embedded in that process. Um, and I'll walk you through here just sort of a few of the, the features and, and areas where we're, we're really just scratching the surface of. Uh, and I sort of invite you sort of as part of our community to really think about where we can go with some of these features and what sort of things might uh, improve them. Um, we do feel that personalization is gonna become increasingly important. Your users in a sense expect it. Uh, from uh, all of the, the variety of services they use, whether it's in the mobile environment or, you know, just, just surfing the web. Um, you know, we have opportunities now within our discovery service to, to ha have users kind of self-identify some information about themselves and provide a more personalized experience. And we see this definitely as an area of, of expansion and, and continued importance. Um, that we think users will welcome and, and sort of inspect, uh, ex come to expect from a, from a discovery service. Um, then we have this sort of range of what I call sort of data-driven services. Um, these are the things that sort of, you know, leverage data, whether it's, it's contributed by the library or a librarian, uh, or algorithmically are using data that we have um, based on usage metrics or relevancy algorithms uh, to help provide, you know, additional paths of exploration and sort of guidance for your users. Uh, again, we're seeing the way users use these discovery services are generally just entering a couple keywords in their queries, um, sometimes, known, you know, a good deal of known item searching, um, and there's kind of a mix and range of things in between. So um, some of the things that, that we see uh, are um, the, uh, a variety of recommendations. So we see um, the, um, you know, resource recommendations that, that Jesse mentioned. Um, with our BX recommender, we can recommend articles. You know, somebody, you read this article, so you might also be interested in these other articles that, uh, other scholarly articles that our um, other users have clicked on. Um, we see you search this. You might want to try to expand your search uh, into some of these other things that we're seeing other people searching as well. Um, there's opportunities for exploration and learning. So um, topical exploration, the ability to kind of provide snippets of information to users, background information on, on topics they were searching, um, using leveraging reference content that's contributed to, to the index, um, the ability to 
pro to expand queries using controlled vocabulary. So even if users don't necessarily know controlled vocabularies, um, we can still apply that data to expand their search. Um, and then still providing opportunities for sort of that serendipitous discovery. So things like browsing through content um, are also important uh, in discovery. The ability for the library to sort of spotlight various collections that they might have, um, providing more visual interest to that discovery is, is also something of importance. So the ability um, to provide what we call sort of image spotlighting or collection spotlighting um, within the context of sort of, you know, you might have a whole bunch of article results coming back, but then you might also see uh, interspersed in that some highlighted sections within the interface um, that, that either can be controlled by the library or sort of algorithmically with relevance uh, to point users to come, some of these sort of special collections and unique content uh, that you might want to point users to. And then there's also the opportunity for really providing sort of deeper exploration paths for users. Uh, again, they, they may not um, have known, you know, everything they needed to look at uh, regarding a topic. Um, and we have something called the citation trail, uh, which provides up uh, users with information on uh, you know, I, if they're looking at an article, you could possibly see all of the things that also cited that article um, or all the articles that, that that article you're reading is citing um, and really go down sort of some, some deep path um, that might really explore a topic more, uh, more fully um, without having to, to know anything other than entering a couple of keywords, clicking on an article that looks interesting and suddenly you're down a path that, that, that's, that's pretty deep. Uh, into a subject. Um, and that's, again, leveraging the data we have uh, on these articles and actually presenting not just citations to your users, but the ability to click in and look at and preview, um, you know, the actual full text of all these articles that might have been cited by or that that article might be citing. There's also third party and sort of external data that we can bring into the discovery service. So things like alt metrics uh, to show, you know, maybe more real time um, you know, beyond just sort of citations, sort of looking at more um, present day sort of mentions, uh, things, uh, you know, tweets, Facebook, et cetera. Uh, the ability to bring in uh, data from synthetics, uh, reviews, uh, as well as recommendations, uh, and again, providing sort of paths for, for users to explore, um, you know, tangential information or, you know, even deeper information depending on what it is. Then there's sort of the fun stuff, which I call sort of uh, librarian-controlled recommendations. Um, our discovery services, beyond just providing, you know, the opportunity to actually chat in real time with users, um, you know, think about being on a shopping website and, you know, you, know, you might be looking for a pair of shoes and you, you might get that little pop-up that says, how can I help you? And, you know, sometimes that can be helpful. You could actually have a librarian working with a researcher in real time uh, within the discovery service. Uh, and you could also have librarians sort of controlling these recommendations. So we, we provide the ability to recommend uh, essentially anything. So if you know sort of, you know, based on a user's uh, query, you could, you know, think of this as sort of Google AdWords for your library. Um, if you can sort of think ahead about what people might be searching, you have a pretty good chance of being able to sort of steer them to uh, really relevant information as well as things like research guides and other things you might have within the library that, that can be helpful to those users. And of course, there's linked data. Uh, we are, are pretty, um, uh, pretty far along in, in working with a number of libraries and, and organizations, and we have a, a strong working group uh, specifically working around linked data and discovery. Uh, we're committed to sort of exploring uh, any of the opportunities around linked data and, and what, the, you know, uh, you know, I think, again, we're just scratching the surface here of sort of what opportunities might come, up, come about uh, that can really enhance patron discovery. Um, and, and I think that that is obviously another direction that, that discovery will be going, and, and the discovery layer needs to be able to accommodate that and be able to sort of easily integrate um, these sort of linked data opportunities that, that might come about. And, the, and these might evolve rather quickly. Um, here's just a couple examples. Uh, where we are using linked data uh, within an, in the discovery service. Um, this is an example of, of using uh, VIOF, you know, to, to be able to, to, to display some supplementary information about co-authors um, right within the discovery layer. 
Um, and another opportunity we, we've looked at is, is using the Library of Congress to present sort of uh, related uh, subject terms and other paths that users can go off of. And again, this, this may be an area that, that you know, may, may be exploding over the next couple of years or so. So putting it all together, um, I kind of quickly ran through, you know, a bunch of features. Directionally, what, what I want you to take away from that is, is the notion that there is this opportunity for libraries to provide uh, contextual guidance and information uh, for your users. Um, we've integrated our discovery services with our Leganto uh, reading list solution, uh, RefWorks for research management, um, Pivot uh, product provides funding and collaboration opportunities, and, as well as Campus M uh, mobile solutions. And you know, all of these things together uh, in combination with that discovery layer um, really put the library, I think, at that sort of place where it belongs, which is really at the center of the sort of research and teaching and, and learning workflows that are happening on campus. And we continue to, you know, our direction for discovery is to continue to evolve it uh, in a way that the library has opportunities uh, to really customize and take advantage of, of their knowledge, of their users and their research mission and their institutional mission around teaching and learning, uh, and continue to position that library at, as the center and sort of, you know, truly valued piece of uh, that greater kind of university mission that's happening. Uh, with that, I think uh, we're going to hand it off. Um, we're just at the top of the hour, but we'll, we'll stay on for a few minutes and make sure that we uh, answer any questions you might have, uh, either for uh, Peter or Jesse uh, or myself. And I think you can use the Q&A functionality uh, of the WebEx. And um, thanks for being with us today. Okay, the first question that we have that came in, where exactly are the terms of agreement stored or pulled from with this code? And I think that's uh, targeted at Jesse. Yeah, so um, that's a good question. And it's uh, sort of a that depends. Well, I guess it's not a that depends question. We use uh, ProQuest's Intoda uh, system to manage our e-resources. That's our e-resource knowledge base. And in that, we uh, we can uh, enter terms from our license agreements. And so that's where those terms uh, reside. For use in our public display, we actually cache those daily with a, with a call to the, uh, there's a license terms API. We use to call basically that full set of records and we store that on a local server and we, we call, we pull those terms from that when someone clicks on display those terms. Okay, uh, here's another question. I believe this one's targeted. Eddie, how do we personalize without contributing to self-selection bias? Uh, that's a very thoughtful question. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, that, that I have the answers for that. And I think, you know, as discovery services evolve and, and move into that area of personalization, um, that it, it's something that we'll have to play with. And, and I think, um, you know, what, what we do today uh, currently in our discovery services sort of allow users to sort of self-select um, whether they want personalization or not and sort of works as a facet where you can turn it on and off. Uh, but where we go in, in the future, um, I'm not sure, and it depends really how deep you want to go. Uh, we may, you know, know things about the user's course, uh, courses that they're taking, for example, um, and they might be a, a biology major or something like that, but they may also be taking a, a course on film studies or something on campus. And so obviously you want to be uh, cognizant of that. I think you know, the best way to do that is, is, you know, really what we're doing with facets and, and similarly to, you know, what I've seen in Google as well, where it says, you know, I'm also searching this. Did you really just want to search this? That we can provide tools within the user interface to allow uh, users to sort of control for some of that. Okay, uh, the next question, um, I believe this is targeted for Jesse. What made Cornell decide to use a Wikipedia entry for explanations uh, in the top right-hand corner instead of a paid encyclopedia source? Um, that actually was from our summon instance, and um, so Eddie might be able to explain better, but uh, from my knowledge of it, those uh, there are several sources, some of which are licensed uh, encyclopedia sources. Um, and the example I took the screenshot of just happened to be a Wikipedia one. We are able to prioritize those 
so that um, I believe we can even exclude, uh, though correct me if I'm wrong, Eddie, uh, certain sources. And we chose not to exclude the Wikipedia ones, but we have those as the sort of last choice to display if there are other options. So I think uh, like Oxford Reference is one of the options and some of the Gale resources will provide some of those entries as well. Yep, that, that was perfect, Jesse. Okay, uh, Eddie, this is targeted for you. Uh, what's the future of Summon and Primo as separate products? Uh, Summon and Primo will continue to be separate products. We have uh, very extensive roadmaps for each that we've shared with our, our user group community. Uh, so those, if you're a customer, those, those are available uh, for you. Um, and we'll, we'll continue to develop them as separate products. As I mentioned, there's over 3,000 plus customers using both products. Um, ho hopefully, happily using the products, uh, and we'll, we'll continue to develop them. Um, the thing that is coming together, which maybe wasn't clear in the presentation, is we're providing a, a sort of new uh, shared content ingestion model. Um, so we sort of streamline the content to make sure that content is normalized uh, across both services. They do sort of have separate discovery indexes. Uh, but we want to make sure that there's equal discovery of content across both services. Okay, uh, this is targeted at uh, Jesse and or uh, Peter. Uh, how many discovery services did you trial or research before making your choice? Did you have trouble selling the librarians on the one search bar? Um, it's a good question. Uh, so we've both trialed and implemented several different things over the years. Uh, as I mentioned, web feed earlier. Um, kind of filled that role as well. Um, uh, each time we were looking for a new product, we did an environmental scan of what was out there. So for example, when we went with Summon, we had been trialing Primo uh, and EDS, uh, as well as what uh, WorldCat could provide at the time. And uh, uh, went with Summon at the time actually because it, when we implemented it actually provided the best API for us to do some of those that bento box result um, and some other work that we had uh, planned and um, selling the library selling the librarians on the one search um, has been I, I, I believe the usability testing has been the biggest tool in being able to do that is that really being able to see data about what works and what doesn't work from a user perspective has helped. Um, and But it's also one of the reasons we have, say, the bento box results as opposed to trying to feed all of our catalog data and all of our institutional repositories and things like that into Summit, uh, for example. I think there was a lot of resistance to trying to have one, one discovery tool handle each and everything in a fair and balanced sort of way. And uh, so that's one reason we're actually piecing together this puzzle of multiple discovery tools to, uh, to provide all these services. Okay, uh, the last question that we have uh, that has come in um, is uh, many of our faculty complain about the lack of precision searching and result sorting in some, and what are the prospects of giving users some choice about fuzziness, such as, uh, as Gail does in Echo? What about options to sort search results by author or item title? I guess that's for me. Um, we can certainly take that um, as an enhancement request. Um, right now, there there is not a plan to, to sort by author, um, but it's something we can certainly look at. Okay, I don't have any uh, Remaining questions, uh, Mark, do you want to have some concluding remarks? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, and thank you, Peter and Jesse and Eddie. Uh, this is Mark, as Scott mentioned, from ACRL and Choice. And I'd like to get, take a moment to give each of our speakers a virtual round of applause. Thank you so much for spending time with us today and for sharing the, the wonderful information that you've got. We greatly appreciate your insight. As a reminder, uh, for folks out, out there listening, we have recorded today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL and Choice that will include instructions on how to access the archive version. Thanks again to everyone out there for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the session, and I hope you have an excellent day.